We are in week three, and today we're going to finish up the section uh, that I've called Kingdom Character. Uh, that is the Beatitudes. Uh, we looked at the first four Beatitudes last week in really a lot of detail. Uh, we're going to try to look at the last four Beatitudes with the same amount of detail tonight, and then jump to the section of Kingdom Influence, Kingdom Influence, and that's where we're going to look at just a couple verses where we talk about being salt and light. That's the preview. That's where we're going. And I hope you're strapped in and ready to go. Go ahead and take your Bibles and in Matthew 5. I'm going to read this entire section again because it fits together. We have to see it together in order for this uh, to make sense to us. And so I begin in chapter 5, verse 1, reading this. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. That's our text for today. Now again, we've looked at the first section there, the first, the first four Beatitudes. So we're going to jump in uh, to the fifth. But before we do so, something that uh, I think it's very important for us to talk about before we advance on, is the fact that each of these Beatitudes, they, they rise one to another. And so while each of the Beatitudes is perfect in and of itself, Jesus could have just said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy, and it would have been a powerful message. But he couples all eight together. And there's a reason why all eight are coupled together. And so as we think about this, as we begin first with blessed are the poor in spirit. We looked at that last week and we said that that is the person who understands that they are spiritually bankrupt. Without Christ, without God, they cannot live. And so they need God, they need Christ in order to be successful in their spiritual life, right? Now, flowing out of that is the emotion of mourning and weeping. Because when I understand who I am, and my inability to save myself, my inability to reach up and bring heaven down, what is the result of that? I weep and I mourn. Now, going one step further would be meekness or humility. Now, the true person or the person who is truly meek, truly humble, first understands cognitively, I can't save myself. I'm not all of that in a bag of chips. And secondarily to that, I understand that in my heart, my sin causes me to understand my brokenness, my hopelessness. Because of that, my, the natural progression of my character leads to meekness. You understand? Now, meekness can be a characteristic all in and of itself, but it is undergirded by the fact that I understand who I am without God. I understand who I am in Christ. I understand the, the sinfulness of my sin, and that puts me into a meek state. Because I understand that in Christ, I'm a completely different person. It's very fascinating. Now, from there, in my meekness, 
Understanding that I'm not able to save myself. Understand that I am weeping because of my sin. What then is the outflowing of my heart, the result of that? Well, it is that I'm hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Because I understand I can't create righteousness of my own, so I'm, I'm hungering for righteousness from heaven, right? And that's where we looked at justification, sanctification, and glorification. I'm hungering for God to save me. I'm hungering for practical righteousness in my life. There's a dehydrated thirst in my heart to be truly changed. All because... I understand my spiritual poverty all because I've mourned over it, all because I've submitted to the lordship of Christ in my life, and all because I want heaven to change me. Now, flowing from that, then, is the fact that I want to be merciful. And that's where we are today. Because I understand that the only way I can reach heaven is because of God's mercy. And because of God's mercy, it leads me to be merciful. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. It's mercy upon mercy and mercy upon mercy. Now, the highest level, then, of blessedness in the Beatitudes would be blessed are the pure in heart and blessed are the peacemakers. It's the highest level of blessedness. But really interesting, as we'll see as we study that passage, it's not that blessedness is multiplied to us. No, we get the same amount of blessedness. And why is that? Because Jesus assumes that all eight characteristics belong to the believer, not just one, but that all eight belong to us, and they should. And so this, in many ways, this passage, these eight Beatitudes should be a mirror to us as we look into our spiritual life. And if we realize that we're not merciful, if we realize we don't possess integrity, if we realize that we really hate to be persecuted and we're going to lash out and be vengeful instead, then what's the result of that? We should look at it and go, whoa, I don't look like Jesus. And that mirror should force us toward change. It's a beautiful passage of scripture. All of this fitting together so well. Now I talked about this briefly last week and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it again, but I want to remind us that the Beatitudes can be split up into two sections. The first four, which we studied last week. The second four, which we're studying today. The first four are more Godward or heavenward Beatitudes, right? I understand my poverty in spirit toward God. I mourn and weep because of my sin. I submit myself to the lordship of of God the Father, and then I hunger and thirst for righteousness from heaven. Those are Godward or heavenward beatitudes. Today's beatitudes are far more people word, relationship word. And why is that? Well, remember when the Pharisees confronted Jesus and said, teacher, what is the greatest commandment? They were expecting Jesus to give them one. But rather, Jesus says, well, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God uh, with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And the second is equal to it. You should love your neighbor as yourself. And I made the point last week that all of the law, one law can be summed up in two commandments. And those two commandments are broken down into 10 categories, if you will, or 10 primary statutes of God. That's the 10 commandments. And then if we further break them down, we get to 613 commandments. So the result then, and I hope you're seeing how all this fits together, is the fact that when I understand I am poor in spirit, when I'm heartbroken over my sin, when I submit to God's leadership and I'm thirsty for righteousness, the result of that is that I'm going to be more merciful. I'm going to live with greater purity. I'm going to pursue peace, really, at all costs in my relationships. And when I am harassed, When I am persecuted, I will take on the character of Christ. That's how all of this fits together. And it's the love of the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and straight commandment. And the second being equal to it, that is that we love our neighbor as ourselves. And so from there, I think it's important we just go ahead and jump right in, right? So the fifth beatitude. 
We might phrase it this way. Kingdom subjects who have, in the past, received God's merciful compassion and help, in abundance, of course, should imitate his character by extending mercy, compassion, and help to others. In other words, what we have received from God the Father in his merciful hand, we should be ready to hand out to those around us. This isn't, mercy is not something we keep for ourselves. Mercy is not something that we hoard to ourselves. Mercy is not something that we put in our mercy bank account and hope that it would gain interest in some way. No, this is something that in and out, that's exactly how it is. I want to give this mercy away. I want to extend it, right? And so really, only a person, I want you to understand this, only a person who has received mercy can give mercy away. Mercy isn't just created. Mercy is something that originates in the character of God. God is all merciful, and so we lean on the character of God in order for us to extend mercy. In other words, the only way that I can truly forgive someone is because I have been forgiven. I understand what forgiveness is, and therefore I can extend forgiveness to others. That's what this beatitude is speaking to. Now, the word here that's used is eleemon, and it means basically to be concerned about someone who is in need, to show them mercy, to be sympathetic, to be compassionate, and this is a full bend toward mercy. It's not an occasional, well, I think I'll go ahead and forgive them this time. I think I'll go ahead and extend mercy this time. No, it is the established pattern of your life. This is what you are truly known by. That because we've been forgiven, generously, generously forgiven, we're going to extend that generosity and that help toward those that are hurting or suffering or have wronged us in some way. Now this is where the Beatitudes, quite frankly, they start to get a little bit more difficult, don't they? Because I can hunger and thirst for righteousness all day long. I'm, I'm good with that. I can place myself under the lordship of, of Christ all day long. Jesus, take the wheel. But then when I have to start displaying the character of Christ, that's when it gets a little bit more, more dicey for me, personally. I want to take you to a passage. Go ahead and go to Matthew 18, just a few pages over to the right. We're not going to have all the time in the world to, to walk through this passage, but I do want to give you the high points, okay? So if we go to Matthew 18, beginning in verse 21. So this is known as the parable of the unforgiving servant. Fits really nicely within the uh, blessed are the merciful, for they shall be, receive mercy beatitude. In verse 21, Peter comes up and says to Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. Now, we just may want to pause together and give brother Peter a round of applause. Because he is far exceeding the righteousness of the Pharisees. Far exceeding it. I've given you the note here in the, in the text. The Pharisees taught that a person should be forgiven twice. That's it. You wrong me once, I'll forgive you. You wrong me twice, I'll forgive you. You wrong me three times, we're done. I will not extend mercy beyond that. So in some ways, if a person wanted to show off and be just a little bit more divine, he could say, I'm going to forgive you three times, but seven Come on, man. That seems absolutely insane that you'd forgive a person seven times. Peter far exceeds it. But Jesus goes on to say, look at verse 22, I, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven times. Now, people would say, okay, well, that's 490 times, and so I'm going to start keeping track. But that's not Jesus' point. 
Jesus' point is there is an endless supply of mercy to you, so there should be an endless supply of mercy to those around you. God expects us to extend mercy. Now, you can go in and you can study this parable for yourself. It's a great study, and I encourage you to do so. The bottom line is Jesus makes it very clear that if you are refusing to forgive, there are consequences in our spiritual life. So there's a bit of a cycle here, and you see it on the screen. God shows us mercy through Christ. We then extend that mercy to others because others are going to wrong us on a regular basis. Am I right? People are going to, so we're going to extend mercy to others because of Christ, because he's extended mercy to me. And then that flows into, we long for more mercy. I think this is really the promise in the beatitude that blessed are the merciful. I've received mercy, so I give mercy away. And what is the result? They shall receive mercy. So God doubles our mercy and he triples our mercy. Why is that? Because as we start to forgive others, we realize how much more we need to be forgiven. And it just keeps coming and coming and coming. We extend merciful compassion. This is an extension of the meekness beatitude as well. We extend merciful compassion because to be meek is to acknowledge that we're sinners. To mourn is to mourn over our sin. To be poor in spirit is to say that we're spiritually bankrupt. And so here in mercy, say, I'm going to have compassion on you because you're a sinner too. You're no different than me. And you need mercy as much as I need mercy. So let me give it to you. A couple passages for you to look at. Ephesians 4, 31 to 32. You can write that down. Ephesians 4, 31 to 32. The Apostle Paul says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. That's the mandate. We'll look at this at the Lord's Prayer here in just a couple weeks as we unpack what Jesus says about forgiveness in, in his prayer. Colossians 3, 12 through 15 it says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. That's a type of mercy, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive, Paul says. And above all else, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Forgiveness and mercy is a characteristic of God, and it's a characteristic of his people. I want to tell you this story here really quick. So many of you, many of you are familiar with uh, Corey Ten Boom and her story. She has a wonderful book, if you've never read it, The Hiding Place. I highly recommend it to you. Uh, but she recalls a post-war meeting with a guard from the Ravensbrück concentration camp. If you're unfamiliar with her story, that's where she was held, and that's where her sister died, and they were subjected to all kinds of indignities. And so she says this, it was at a church service in Munich that I saw him, the former SS man who had stood guard at the shower room door in the processing center at Ravensbrück. He was the first of our actual jailers that I had seen since that time. And suddenly, it was all there. The room full of mocking men, the heaps of clothing, Betsy's pain-blanched face. He approached me as the church emptied, beaming and bowing. How grateful I am for your message, Fraulein, he said. To think that, as you say, he has washed my sins away. His hand thrust out to shake mine. And I, who had so often preached to the people of the village the need for forgiveness, I kept my hand at my side. Even as the angry, vengeful thoughts boiled through me, I saw the sin of them. 
Jesus Christ had died for this man, was I going to ask for more? Lord Jesus, I prayed, forgive me and help me to forgive him. I tried to smile and I struggled to raise my hand, but I could not. I felt nothing, not even the slightest spark of warmth or charity. And so again, I breathed the silent prayer, Jesus, I cannot forgive him. Give me your forgiveness. As I took his hand, the most incredible thing happened. From my shoulder along my arm and through my hand, a current seemed to pass from me to him. And while my heart sprang into love for this stranger, that almost overwhelmed me. Now that's a pretty radical example, right? A German SS concentration camp guard. Shortly after this, many of these guards were tried and persecuted, imprisoned. Some of them killed for their crimes. But here, Corey said it was, it was important. It was essential for me to extend mercy to that man. Was I going to require more than Jesus' death on the cross for his sin? It's a powerful statement. But when we hold on to bitterness and hold on to a grudge and when we hold on to these things and we say, I refuse to forgive, what are we doing? That's exactly what we're saying. God, you've got to sacrifice more in order for this person to be forgiven because I refuse to forgive them in sufficiency of Christ's death on the cross. It's something powerful for us to think about. Now, I do want to walk through this really quickly, and that this is, you know, it's, it's important for us to understand what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness sometimes gets a bad rap and a misunderstanding. So first, forgiveness is not a natural response. It is a supernatural one. That's why, as Corey Ten Boom said, she said, God, Jesus, I need your forgiveness. If I'm going to forgive, your mercy has to flow through me. I need to receive it first. I, I just, I have the inability to forgive without first mercy. And this is part of that upside down kingdom thing that we've talked about many times. God, I need your strength in order to complete this task. Now, secondly, forgiveness is not the same as reconciliation. Sometimes people couple these things together. You can extend, you can extend forgiveness to a person, extend mercy to a person when reconciliation is not warranted. And there's lots of examples of reconciliation not being warranted. Uh, good examples of that would be abuse. If someone has abused another person, I can forgive them, but it doesn't mean we're going to have Christmas dinner together. There's no reconciliation there. Uh, sexual immorality, or oftentimes if the offender refuses to admit culpability, perhaps reconciliation doesn't happen immediately. But the first step in all of that process is to take the mercy that you've received and hand it over to that person. Forgiveness is also not a feeling. Okay, I don't feel like I want to forgive him. Well, of course you don't. It is a willful decision. I will forgive them. God, I forgive, you fill in the blank, because of fill in the blank. That's it. It is a willful decision that we make to release that person. Forgiveness is also not excusing the wrong. A couple good examples of this. Well, the primary and best example is Joseph in the Old Testament in Genesis 50, 20. When his brothers were pretty terrified after their dad died, what is Joseph going to do to us? And the text says that Joseph reports what you meant for evil, God meant it for good, that we would save all of these people here in Egypt. So Moses understood, or excuse me, Joseph, Joseph understood you did something evil. Let's call it what it is. It's evil. It's wrong. It's sinful. But God took the wrong, and he did something powerful with it. So it's not just saying, oh, it's okay. No, that's, that's not forgiveness. Oh, it's okay. Have you ever said that to a person? It's okay. Don't worry about it. That's not forgiveness. I forgive you. God never says, oh, it's okay that you sinned. No. That's, that's, that's foreign to Scripture. Rather, I forgive. I think that's very important for us to look at, okay? Also, forgiveness is not letting the guilty off the hook. 
It's taking them off your hook and putting them on God's hook. Scripture makes it very clear that we're not to avenge ourselves. We're not to take action in that way. We're not the singular judge, jury, and executioner in these instances. No, instead we hand that person over to God and look to God to do what he does. I think that's very important. It also is that forgiveness is not being weak or being a doormat for someone just to step on and take advantage of you. If that's the case, that would be God's characteristic. And that's problematic, is it not? Highly problematic. So God forgives out of strength, not out of weakness. And then finally, it has nothing to do with fairness. I can't forgive that person because it's not fair. Well, in many respects, your forgiveness that you've received in Christ is not fair either. What is fair, according to Scripture, is hell. But God extends grace and mercy to you so that you don't have to do the fair thing. It's unfair. Grace is unfair. Mercy is unfair because God extends something to you that doesn't belong to you. Perhaps you've heard this quote before. Max Licato is quoted as saying, forgiveness is setting someone else free and then realizing that you were the prisoner. Because bitterness chains us up, does it not? And unforgiveness becomes a taskmaster. And it harms us and it hurts us emotionally, sometimes even physically, definitely spiritually. And so we release the person. So what are some ways that we might work this out, friends? Number one, refuse to hold on to bitterness. That's a willful action. Refuse to hold on to bitterness. When you see it creeping up, and this is why we need accountability, because sometimes you don't even recognize the root of bitterness uh, penetrating down into your soul. And so you need someone to say, hey, I think, I think you've got the grudge worm. And you need to get that thing out of your heart because it's going to do all kinds of damage. Refuse to hold on to bitterness. The next one is to follow the example of Christ. That passage right there, Luke 23, 24, is where Jesus, hanging on the cross, looks out over his Roman executioners and says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. He extends mercy when they never asked for it. He extends forgiveness where they never bowed a knee, never prayed, never said, God, please forgive me for what I'm doing. Follow the example of Jesus. Extend forgiveness to others always and practice it daily. So just a personal confession, I guess. Will you be my confession booth for a moment? So I'm a grudge holder. Now, I don't hold grudges long, okay? But in the intense heat of the moment, I will hold on to that grudge. And I will refuse to extend forgiveness for a period of time. Now, eventually I cool off and basically I forget about it. Oh, well, just move on, okay? Well, I've not extended forgiveness. I've not gone through the spiritual discipline of extending forgiveness to that person. And so really what I'm doing is I'm adding this nonsense to my account to where eventually it's going to explode. So me personally, as I look through this, is I need to regularly practice this. This is something that needs to be at the forefront of my mind that any time I feel that grudge worm, I'm going to do everything I can to extend forgiveness. And I'm not going to allow that to be held for a moment, for a season, or for any other length of time. Why? Because God doesn't ever withhold mercy from me. John 1, 1 John 1 and 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness. It never says if he feels like it. Or if he's done holding his grudge. Or if God decides he's not going to be bitter anymore. No, it's immediate. And that's what we should do as we emulate the character of Christ. We'll move on to the next beatitude. That is the pure in heart. To be pure in heart, Scripture says, we will see God. So, <clears throat> J. Dwight Pentecost says this, purity is not measured by the practices of people, but rather by the character of God himself. This is taking on the character of God and the actions of God. To be pure in heart. 
I might phrase it this way, kingdom subjects live with outward purity and resolute integrity. And because of this, they experience greater intimacy with the Father. So to be pure in heart, remember, to be pure in heart is part of the section that has to do with our manward attitudes and our manward actions, right? How we, how we relate to people around us. So purity of heart is not just a sanctification or purity within me, but it's purity that leaks out of me. Take this passage, for example. Psalm 24, verse 3 through 6. Psalm 24, verse 3 through 6. And it says, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false or does not swear deceitfully. Do you see there how being pure in heart has outward actions? That's important. Purity of heart is evidenced by the way that we act exterior to us, outward from us. Goes on, says, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of God of Jacob. So this question, who may ascend the holy hill? Well, Jesus answers that question here in Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in spirit, for they shall see God. We want to see God. We have purity in heart, and a purity of heart that is not just within, but it's out of us. It's how we act. Now, isn't it interesting? It's interesting to me that as the new covenant in the Old Testament is described, that is, what is the result of the Messiah coming, dying, being buried, raising again? What is the result inwardly, right? So Ezekiel 36 Verse 25 to 26 says this, I will, God speaking, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all of your uncleanness. And from your idols, I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. So says God. Now, similarly, we're not going to read this passage, but you can go look at it at your own. Jeremiah 31, verse 31 to 34. Again, the result of us being partakers of the new covenant is that God has sprinkled clean water, water on us. He has purified our hearts. He has purified our hands. He's purified our heads so that we would act differently. That is, that we would act with moral uprightness. Now, contrast that with what Jesus says to the Pharisees. If you want to, you can turn over to Matthew 23, really quick. Matthew 23, verse 25 to 28. It's one of the woe passages. And Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside you're full of greed and and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee. You think he won any friends here? This is not a good way to build friends and influence people in Jerusalem right now, okay? He says, you first clean the inside of the cup and the plate that the outside also may be clean. Did you catch it? You first clean the inside. You want to adopt the character of God on the inside. We hunger and thirst for righteousness so that we would be truly changed on the inside and being pure of heart, it affects our actions on the outside. Jesus says to the Pharisees, you're just whitewashed tombs. You're beautiful on the exterior, but you're full of dead man's bones. You're unclean, and while you appear righteous to others, you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. So the idea here is, again, my heart affects what I do. Being affects doing. Being first, doing second. Not doing that makes me be something. Okay? If you walk into a doctor's office and say, I think I'm going to be a phlebotomist today, 
So you walk into the room and start poking people with needles. Doesn't make you a phlebotomist, does it? No. That makes you arrested. <laughs> but if you go and get your phlebotomy license, that's your being, then you can walk into that room and start poking people with needles and people let you do it. Right? Makes sense? Being comes before doing. So the whole idea here is purity of heart is evidenced outside of us. So let's look at this uh, with a little bit more detail, okay? So let's zero in on the heart, okay? The heart. Now the heart, in a biblical sense, and in a psychological sense, is the nerve center of our collective self. It's the spring of our personal being, right? Or it's the seat of our rational will. Some people call it the emotional and volitional command center of our life. This is where we say, I feel, that's your heart, not your head, I feel, right? Or my heart is leading me when we love someone, we feel with our heart. When we hate someone, we feel with our heart. So the heart, it's that volitional command center, right? Now Jesus' words in Matthew 15 are significant. Where Jesus says, but one comes out of the mouth, where does it come from? The heart. What comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. Not what goes in. He was combating the Pharisees, the scribes, and the Sadducees at this point. They're saying, hey, whatever you put in makes you unclean. Jesus says, oh, no, 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 no. Whatever comes out of you makes you unclean because it reveals what's in here. So if you ever have somebody they, and they say something really unkind, unnecessary, even mean, and then they say, oh, I didn't mean it. I'm sorry to tell you, yes, they did. Now, they may not know that they did because it's so deep in their heart, but that's what they mean. That's Jesus' point here. Where it proceeds from the heart, comes out of our mouth, and then he says, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. These defile a person. So let's put these ideas together then. To be fully transformed in my heart, to be pure in heart means that. My outward character is marked by virtue, kindness, gentleness, godliness, integrity, faithfulness, piety. The characteristics of God now become my characteristics because I am pure in heart. So if I act like Jesus toward you, you know it's not me. It's Jesus inside of me that has radically transformed me that leads me to be the person that I'm being toward you. To be pure in heart means that my activity with others has been fully sanctified. An idea here is an irreproachable character. Paul talks about this when he talks about church leaders. He says we're to be above reproach. That means beyond criticism. It doesn't mean we're perfect. Ah, na 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 na. Please don't ever put any of us on that pedestal because we're not. But there's a faultless character because we're pure in heart. So much of this is going to be developed further on in the text of the Sermon on the Mount, particularly next week. You might also look at a passage of Romans 12, 9 through 21. Write that down, Romans 12, 9 through 21, or I guess it's on your slide. But Paul says things like, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Don't be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and show them hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony. Don't be haughty. On and on and on. Why can we act that way? Because it's not natural to me. We can act that way because Jesus, through the Spirit of God, has taken residence up in my heart and I am now pure in heart. And the result of all of this is that we draw nearer to God. We put our eyeballs on him. Now, I really hope the way that I've explained it leads you to understand how far out of reach it is. 
This is why a lot of people read through the Sermon on the Mount and like, throw this out, man. It's too difficult. There's no way we can get there. So why should we even try? I know it's hard because I still have this flesh suit on. And so the action that we ought to take is James 4, 8, where it says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. In other words, this is a daily ask of heaven. Would you transform me and give me your purity, O God, that I might live with radical integrity and God-like faithfulness and tremendous fidelity and be good and kind and hospitable so when people look at me, they see Jesus. That's all I want them to see. I want them to see Jesus. That's being pure of heart. And the result of this is that we see God we see God. And that means we're guaranteed a place in heaven, of course, because that's where God is. But also that we begin to see God working more and more and more in our lives. Because you see where you act one way, and you're like, I've never acted that way before. That was pretty awesome. And you realize, oh, wait, that was Jesus. I get to see God. Moving on, it's blessed are the peacemakers or blessed are the harmonious. And uh, the word peacemaker, it's a very, very interesting word. Uh, this is the only time that this word is used in the New Testament. Uh, it's a compound word. It's two different words. Irene is the word for peace. If anybody in here's name is Irene or you have a friend named Irene, that's peace, right? That's where we get the word Irene, Irene, peace. And then poieo means to do or to make, right? It's more of a crafting term, okay? So you couple those words together and you come up with peacemaker, okay? Now it's very important here. I don't want you to miss this. This is peacemaker, not peacekeeper, okay? So a peacekeeper, you go into a situation and you're keeping the peace. That is, peace existed before. You're doing everything you can to maneuver the situation to let peace remain. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about the active creation of something that didn't exist before. What am I creating? I'm creating peace. Now, Jesus is the chief uh, peacemaker. Why? Because peace did not exist before. Jesus died on the cross, and Scripture says he made peace with God for us. Jesus is a peacemaker. Before there was conflict and tension and strife and division between us and God the Father because of our sin, but because of the cross, Jesus made peace with us and the Father. So if we're going to uh, emulate the character of Christ, we're going to pursue peace, make peace in any situation we can. In that regard, peacemakers are the sons of God because this is one of those divine activities that only God does. No politician can make peace. No king or pontiff can make peace. Only God Almighty can create peace. And we, being Christians, Christ in me, is what that word means, Christ in me, the Holy Spirit in me, now I can make peace. And I'm going to do whatever I can to be God-like and pursue reconciliation. In a lot of different ways, by the way. And this is important. Now, if you've been with me for a while in Bible study, when we study the book of Genesis, we actually walk through this. And I'm going to do this in like super fast. So if we look at Genesis 3, that's the fall. Remember? Eve was tempted. She took and ate the fruit. Adam took the fruit from her, did not say, woman, what are you giving me? He said, give me some of that. I want some. So he ate it, okay? Deliberate rebellious action. And because of that, the fall happened. And when the fall happened, death spread to all mankind. A result of death is separation, division, conflict, strife, brokenness, etc., so there are six different divisions 
that we see as a result of the fall. The first is man is separated from God. Relationship is fractured. Man walks away from God. Man creates alternative religions. Rather than worshiping the one true God, they worship the created order. Man is separated from God. The first evidence of this is when God shows up in the afternoon to take his afternoon walk with Adam and Eve, God says, where are you? Now, by the way, that didn't mean God didn't know where they were. No, he's evidencing to us that there was a division and there was conflict now in that relationship. The next one is man separated from himself. This is bad. Because not only do we see brokenness in our relationship with God the Father, but we see brokenness within ourselves. This is where we see things like guilt and psychological abnormality or even pain in childbirth or death. This is why we need psychiatrists and psychologists today. Because we're separated from ourselves, We're wrong in some way mentally, emotionally. We label this today mental health issues, right? But it goes beyond that in addictions of all kinds. It goes beyond that into all kinds of medicine. Why do we need medicine? Because our bodies are breaking down. Because we're being separated from ourselves. And we no longer work as we're supposed to work. Another one is man is separated from fellow man, from fellow humanity. It's where we see, see things like accusations and hatred and strife and breakup of all kinds of relationships, murder and deceit and covetousness. It's where we see abuse and, 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 and all, of these, all of these radical displays of sinfulness and wrong. We see that because man is separated from fellow man. We also see how man is separated from nature. This is evidenced in the garden as well, where we see where the snake, there's enmity between mankind and the serpent. There's a painful toil and sweat in our work. We were expelled from the garden, not allowed to stay in the, the pleasure and paradise of God's garden that he created just for us. And then, of course, animals are terrified of us because we have to take their lives for food and for clothing. And before this, Adam could walk up to any animal in the garden. They'd be like, hey, Adam, what's up? After, not so much. And then, of course, nature is separated from nature. We see the ground is cursed as well. We see this in the garden of the thistles and the thorns. We see Romans 8, 20, where creation was subjected to futility. This is where we see earthquakes and hurricanes and tsunamis and floods and tornadoes and droughts and lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. It's broken. Now, the final division in all of this is the cross. Now, the sixth division didn't happen until Jesus put his feet on earth. He was betrayed by a friend and nailed to a cross. But at the cross, we see a revisiting of all the previous five divisions. We see man from God. The son was separated from the father. He was our substitute. We see man from himself and that Jesus was separated from himself. When Jesus was laid in that borrowed tomb, his spirit had departed his body separated from himself as a result of our sin. Man from fellow man, remember that everybody turned from Jesus. His disciples ran away. His brothers accused him. They took a spear and shoved it into his side. Jesus was completely isolated from all of humanity on the cross. We see also the man from nature, See, he was crowned with thorns, a vestige of the garden. He drank bitter wine, symbolizing a bitter life. He was nailed to a cross, a tree, man's very source of temptation. All pregnant symbols in the crucifixion. And then finally, nature from nature. Scripture says that the sky was darkened, no light shone. 
There was a great earthquake. The rocks split open. The tombs were opened and people rose from the dead and wandered through the city. The sixth division is the cross. Now it's interesting that because Jesus experienced all of those divisions, he also puts it all back together again. I want to symbolize this to you with just a simple diagram. So if we look at our relationship with God in the garden, humanity and God are pointed toward one another. How do you know you're in, I tell this to my kids all the time, how do I know you're listening to me? You look me in my eye, right? If you turn your back on me, I don't think you're listening. There's no relationship there. So we're face to face. When the fall happened, there was a departure. God turned his back on us because of our sin, and we, in our rebellion, turned our back on him. At the cross, as we just looked at, the cross made it uh, uh, okay, made it possible for God to turn his face back toward us. He turns his face toward us. Now, remember there, we're still faced away. The cross wasn't a blanket salvation for every person. Rather, salvation restores. So this is what's called reconciliation. This is peacemaking 101 in the Bible. Now with all of that said, the practical outworking of this, friends, is that we're going to do whatever we can to pursue peace Now, in what areas of life should I pursue peace? Perhaps you're asking yourself that question. I would argue that we're going to pursue peace in every area of division that was caused at the garden. So practical peacemaking, Psalm 34, verse 14. Turn away from evil and do good, seek peace and pursue it. Psalm 133, 1 through 3. Uh, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, uh, which falls on the mountains of Zion. There the Lord has commanded the blessing life forevermore. How blessed it is to dwell in peace. So let's walk through these categories. Category one, God with man. How do we... As believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, peace make, make peace when there is a division between an individual and his or her creator. Evangelism. The only way to make peace in those situations is to reconcile that individual back into a relationship with God. And we know that the only way for that relationship to be be restored is if that person will make a confession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So evangelism is peacemaking. It is the ministry of reconciliation, Paul calls it. That is that passage there in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 through 21. He says, Christ has reconciled us to himself and has given to us the ministry of of reconciliation. That is, Christ was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against us and entrust to us the message of reconciliation. What is that? Well, it's that great, great passage in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, that God made him who knew no sin to be sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. That's peace. Because in salvation, peace is established between man and God. The next one there is to seek peace within ourselves. Remember that division of we're separated from ourself. Well, there's lots of different ways that we could do that. And it's, by the way, the key way is not going to Barnes and Noble and going to the self-help section. That's not it. But rather it is digging into the word of God and understanding who you are in Christ. It is your identity and it is spiritual formation, forming your heart, forming your will, forming your mind after Christ. I give you that passage there in Ephesians 1, which is a great passage that speaks to our identity, that we as followers of Jesus have been blessed 
with every spiritual blessing, that we're adopted, that we're chosen, that we're predestined, that we're sealed by the Spirit of God, and on and on and on. But it goes beyond that to where we're loved. <coughs> Excuse me, we're transformed. We're a completely new person. When we know who we are in Christ, it radically affects our, quote, mental health. Next one there is seeking reconciliation between man and man. This is restoration. This is where I'm going to actively put myself into a situation in order to take this party and this party and fit them back together. I'm going to pursue peace. Now that's messy, isn't it? And dangerous sometimes. You gotta watch yourself. There might be fists flying. But pursue peace. Pursue peace. Be like God and make peace. Don't just step back and go, oh man, I'm, I'm ready to watch this car wreck. It's going to be awesome. No, I step in and I make peace. Seeking peace in relationships, this is another avenue of this. But this is marriage, parenting, so on and so forth. This is wives with, with their husbands and husbands with their wives. Peter says in 1 Peter 3, 7, husbands live with your wife in an understanding way. That means pursue peace with her. There's this idea in Jewish marriage teaching called shalom bayit, and that is the peace of the home. Now the word shalom, by the way, it's where we get our word Irene, where we get our word Irene, but shalom it's not just absence of strife. That's not what shalom means. It's complete and total wholeness. So when you walk into a Jewish person's home and they say shalom, they're just not saying, I hope you're having a nice day. It means I hope you are from the hair on your head to the bottom of your feet. I hope you are whole and complete. That you are relating to God in the right way. I hope that you have experienced true and lasting peace, completeness in all of it. So shalom bayit, that is the peace of the home. That we're, we're, we are, as believers in Christ Jesus, to pursue a peaceful home, really, at all cost. Now this is maybe where some people get the idea of happy wife, happy life. I don't know, maybe. Don't necessarily like that idea. Not that I don't want my wife to be happy, to be clear. But we don't just give in, but we pursue peace and reconciliation and restoration in all circumstances. And this bends into peace with nature, et cetera, et cetera. I want to give you those two passages there, peace in all circumstances. Uh, look at that passage of Ephesians 4. Well, we've actually looked at that already, so I'm not going to read that again. Okay? Let's go ahead and move on to our final beatitude, and that is to the persecuted, the kingdom of heaven, or blessed are the harassed. <clears throat> now, I put it together like this. Kingdom subjects who faithfully execute on the first seven beatitudes are going to be guaranteed harassed and persecuted by the unbelieving world. But Jesus says, take heart because the kingdom of heaven belongs to you. That being persecuted and harassed because of our faith, that's an evidence that we're kingdom citizens. And that should lead us to rejoice and be happy. Now, when, I'm sure when Jesus' followers heard him say this, they were very confused. Because they were convinced that the Messiah was going to come and he was going to set up his kingdom and he was going to kick Rome out and it was going to be great because Rome wasn't going to be there. That's all they wanted, Rome to go away. They were expecting a strong conqueror, but Jesus says, no, you need to expect persecution and suffering and trials and pain. They probably looked at each other and went, I'm not sure we want to follow this guy. It's not what we were hoping for. But as Jesus did in every single one of the other Beatitudes in his upside-down kingdom, he says to be in 
pain. To suffer, to be persecuted is a position of blessedness. How about that? It's a position of blessedness. And why is that? Because kingdom subjects who endure these persecutions and endure these insults and these slanders by those who oppose God and his kingdom, what happens? We join the company of the faithful who have gone on before us, that fraternity of the righteous saints who have experienced the exact same thing because so did Jesus. And again, that's evidence that we get to spend eternity in heaven. The church experiences supernatural joy when we experience these things at the hand of an unbelieving world. Acts 5.41 says, Then they left the presence of the council, check this out, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for his name. It's the last time someone persecuted you for your faith and you went, Yay, God! I'm so glad you chose me. Reminds me of that moment in The Fiddler on the Roof. If you're familiar with that great musical, and Tevye says at one point, he looks up to heaven and he says, God, I know we're your chosen people, but once in a while, won't you choose someone else? (laughs) It's kind of what we feel like, right? Now listen, no no one should court pain. And no one should truly enjoy, from a physical nature, pain. That's, that's sick. But rather, understanding the cause of the persecution, that's what leads us to rejoice. Because we're kingdom citizens, and we're experiencing persecution because we belong to the kingdom. The text doesn't say, blessed are the persecuted, period. Period. It says, blessed are those who are persecuted for my sake or on my account. So Jesus isn't saying every time you stub your toe, blessed are you, you're bearing the reproach of Jesus. That's not it. But when someone comes at you because you're a believer, that's what Jesus is speaking to. Now, sadly, many Christians interpret their lack of Christianity as persecution. Many Christians get persecuted, so to speak, because they have an unpleasant personality. Because they're rude or insensitive or thoughtless or selfish. Or worse, they're just obnoxious. (laughs) Now, the world capitalizes on this. And I'm not saying I watch this show at all, but if you're familiar with The Simpsons, (laughs) Flanders is the world's imagery of us. Because it finds us to be obnoxious. Some people are rejected because they're discerned to be proud and arrogant and judgmental and unfriendly. Others are ridiculed simply because they're lazy or they're irresponsible or worse, incompetent. That's not what Jesus is talking about. We shouldn't also interpret the consequences of sin as persecution, to be clear. If you speed and get pulled over, that's not persecution. You broke a law, it's a crime. And you should bear the responsibility. If you don't do your work and get demoted, you're not experiencing persecution because you're a Christian. It's because you haven't worked heartily as under the Lord. In the text, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Those that look like, act like, and love like Jesus, those are the ones who will be persecuted. It's the faithful worker of 20 years that keeps getting passed over uh, for a promotion because they're a Christian, because they're outspoken, because they, they hold a Bible study in the break room on Thursday afternoons. And corporate doesn't want to advance them because they don't want that mixed up in their company. It's the Christian student being isolated from his or her friends. It's someone being considered a Bible thumper because they will not gossip. And it goes on 
and on and on. Really, what's being said is that if you emulate the character of the Beatitudes, that's what the world hates. How does this look? So if you're poor, and you're poor, you're, uh, poor in spirit, right, that runs counter to the world that we live in. Because an unbelieving heart is full of pride and admires self-sufficiency and the, because the, the ethic of the world, as we talked about, is self-righteousness. So they persecute those who have a biblical worldview. To mourn over sin is definitely not appreciated in our world today, right? Especially when sin is biblically defined. So a repentant heart mourns and sorrows and, and, repent, and repents of their sin. In society, that's, that's taboo. They say, there's, there's no weeping, there's no crying. Weeping is weakness. Pull yourself up by your own bootstrap. The gentle and meek person, well, we've already talked about that. Meekness is weakness in the world. Hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Spiritual righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus, it's, it's foreign and repugnant in a world, especially a world who's, who's lusting over, over pleasure and preservation and self-promotion, the world that yearns and covets for what they can see and taste and, and touch. So a believer who says, I want to be more like Jesus, I, I, more righteousness to me help, me, help me become like Jesus, who has their Bible open, who's who's hungering and thirsting for the word of God, that person is going to be ridiculed and persecuted oftentimes. The truly merciful person who not only feels genuine compassion for others, but extends mercy to others in this callous, bearing world, that's definitely countercultural, And they don't like it. I'd rather have you be bitter than forgiving to the pure integrity is not celebrated faithfulness is not celebrated doing it by the books speaking truth doing it honestly it's not celebrated let's bend the rules let's tell a little untruth and that believer is ostracized and denigrated and ridiculed and finally for the peacemaker in a world that's focused on getting what I want at all costs, why would I make peace with people who are in my way? The world would rather be at war. Do you see how all of these characteristics, when we live them out, the result is we're going to be persecuted because of it. But take heart. The kingdom of heaven belongs to us. Jesus says, John 15 18, 18 through 20 says that the world hates you. Know that it hated me before you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not above his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. Bonhoeffer says, if you're familiar with Bonhoeffer's story, he says, suffering is among the most important marks of the true church. Discipleship means allegiance to the suffering Christ, and it is therefore not at all surprising that Christians should be called upon to suffer. In fact, it is a joy and token of his grace to be persecuted. Jesus says in Matthew 16, 24, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. It's very likely Jesus lost followers that day because there were lots of people following him, most of the people following him that were well acquainted with what it meant to be nailed to a cross. The Romans did it all the time. And someone who was condemned would have to carry the cross piece of their cross to uh, the piece that was in the ground before they were nailed to it. Jesus says, take it up. Know that you will suffer. Know that you will be persecuted. And this is what it means to follow me. Are you ready? That's what it means. 
something for us to consider here is I think that there's a tragedy in the church today and that most Christians isolate themselves from the world. They go to a church that's 100% Christian. They go to a Bible studies that are 100% Christian. They attend Christian schools. They travel with believers, exercise with believers, socialize with believers, social media with believers, on and on and on, do business with believers, so on and so forth. They're, they're sealed off from persecution because all we do is hang out with our own tribe. And then when we are with outsiders, we hide it. Now the question there is, is hidden Christianity Christianity at all? Is that what Jesus wants from us? Now the answer to that question is, of course, in this next section. Matthew 5, 13 through 16, I'll read it again for us. It says, you are the salt of the earth. If salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world, a city set on a hill, and it cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Hidden Christianity is unacceptable, but instead you and I have a responsibility, Jesus-given responsibility, to put our faith out there, to make it abundantly clear. And the two examples that Jesus gives are first, you are the salt of the earth, you're the salt of the world. Well, there's been lots and lots and lots of study on this. And lots of bickering and commentaries of here's what Jesus meant and here's what Jesus didn't mean and so on and so forth. I'm okay with all of the examples, quite frankly. Salt was used for a lot of different things in Jesus' time. It was used to create thirst. Perhaps you've heard the phrase, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. I repudiate that. Yes, you can. You can feed him salt. And he'll get super thirsty, and he'll probably drink your water. Now, while we chuckle at that just a little bit, that was actually a common practice in the Middle East and is still today. Individuals would carry on their belt a pouch of salt, and they would ever so often reach in and take a few grains of salt and put it on their tongue to remind themselves, I'm thirsty. I need to drink water. It's hot. I'm dehydrated. And it was something to signal the brain, it's time to take a drink of water. And so in the same way, our presence as fully displayed beatitude believers, kingdom subjects, kingdom citizens, what is the goal but that we would salt the oats of an unbelieving world that they would go, hmm, there's something different about them, and I want to drink whatever they are drinking. The prophet Isaiah speaks of this, and that there's this, there's this invitation, Isaiah 55, come and drink of the water that has no price. Drink deeply, Paul says, of his own fellow uh, Jewish individuals, he says, I magnify my ministry in hopes that I would make some of them jealous so that they would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you live your life in such a way to make an unbelieving world jealous? That's what it means to create thirst. Your job is to live and be so much like Jesus that when people look at you, they go, I want to drink that. I want it. Another one is it that preserves the decay. Salt is sometimes used to be put on a piece of meat or something like that, and it preserves from decay. So when we live holy lives, we push against, we fight against the natural progression of the downward spiral of our culture. The Holy Spirit is the restrainer of evil in our world. So the Holy Spirit in me, when I live out and let my, let it, let my Christianity ooze out of me, what am I doing? I'm restraining evil. <coughs> Far too many Christians today are excusing evil. 
rather than restraining it. Thomas Constable, great Bible teacher, says salt is also an antiseptic. So the disciples were a moral disinfectant in a sin-infested world. And how do we do this? We live with virtue. And with virtue, we change the world. Also, it improves the taste. I know you all have reached for the salt shaker and put a little bit on because it needed just a little bit of taste. That's what salt does. Can you imagine with me, not as John Lennon did, a world without God, but a world full of believers who were fully on fire for Christ, living virtuous lives, lives of integrity, lives of moral uprightness, and what our culture would look like. That's what it means to improve the taste. Now, what in the world does it mean that salt would lose its saltiness? Well, in this particular time, the salt that was used would oftentimes decompose in a way that the saltiness would no longer be present if a person would taste it. And so Jesus says, if you have saltless salt, it has no use. It doesn't do what it was designed to do. It became as sand. Sand is plentiful. Salt is scarce. And so we must maintain our testimony in an unbelieving world. That's what it means to be salty. I like going to the beach down in Florida because they have those shirts, stay salty. I think I'm going to get one this year now that I have unpacked this passage. Or maybe I'll make my own. Stay salty, Matthew 5. The next one here is light of the world. Now this is very self-explanatory. It is this idea that light provides direction. It points people to a proper path. Light attracts to itself. Light reveals, light exposes. It's impossible to overcome light. If you light a candle in a dark room, the darkness flees. So we're not to be a hidden individual, but rather we are to, as our pastor says often, light a candle, not just curse the darkness. Light the candle and let your light shine because even the faintest of light can penetrate penetrate the deepest darkness. And so we have a responsibility here, friends, to influence the culture, to influence the culture, to help the culture understand their need for God's grace and mercy, to help the culture understand that God can overcome their sin, to show them that it's right to submit to our Lord and to make him the Lord of their life, that we can trust in his sovereignty and his providence and his protection and his provision, that we should hunger and thirst for righteousness, righteousness from heaven, that we should display mercy as Jesus displayed mercy to us, that we should pursue inward purity that leaks out of us, that radically transforms the way that we live, actively pursue peace, be a peacemaker in all the areas of our life and be ready to withstand persecution because when we do we'll be exactly who who God called us to be salt of the earth the light of the world shining God's goodness into a world that so desperately desperately needs it amen before we pray I just want to draw your attention to our meditation for next week you see the text there that we're going to be focused in on and what we look at next week is going to it's going to couple so well intentionally well uh, with what we looked at with being pure in spirit okay and so I want you to look at that look at Jesus definition of righteousness and see how that matches up uh, with the beatitudes I think that'll be a worthwhile study for you uh, let me go ahead and pray and we'll uh, we'll be done Father God thank you so much for this time in your word Father we have feels like we've run a marathon this evening Father, I just pray that you would take this truth, and Father, that um, all of my friends here that have studied your word tonight, that they would meditate on it, that they would digest it, that they would 
allow this truth to ruminate in their heart and in their mind. And that, Father, we would truly seek to become transformed in every way. Father, this is the man that I want to be. Would you help me to live in such a way that I would be the salt of the earth and the light of the world? Father, I pray that same prayer for my brothers and sisters here tonight. We ask all of this in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. Amen.